Welcome to my channel, Arts and Literature. Today I will decode the first chapter of Susan Basenet's famous book, Translation Studies. Let's start. Translation is the process of converting written or spoken content from one language into another by preserving its original meaning. Translation is not just about swapping words from one language to another. It's not just about replacing words, it's more like understanding signs and symbols in one culture and finding their equivalent in another. Translation involves not only knowing the dictionary and grammar rules but also understanding the cultural context and emotions, capturing the essence and vibe of the original message. It's more than just linguistic skills, it belongs most properly to semiotics. Semiotics is the study of how signs and symbols convey meaning, not just through words but also through gestures, images, and cultural context. It's like transferring not only the words but also the cultural and contextual signs from one language to another. That's why translation involves more than just linguistic knowledge. It's a cultural bridge. It's about understanding the deeper meaning behind words and symbols to carry that meaning across languages and cultures. Language and culture are deeply interconnected. Language is not merely a tool for communication. It's a fundamental part of culture, influencing how people think, perceive the world, and interact with each other. Culture shapes language, determining its structure, vocabulary, and expressions. In turn, language reflects the values, traditions, history, and beliefs of a society. Language and culture are two sides of the same coin. Different cultures use different signs and symbols. A thumbs up might mean great in one place and terrible in another. Translation challenge, finding the right sign in another language that carries the same meaning and cultural weight as the original is where translation gets tricky. A simple dictionary might tell you a word's meaning, but it doesn't tell you the cultural context, the emotions it evokes, or the jokes it's connected to. That's where understanding the whole sign system of a culture comes in. Edward Sapir claims that language is a guide to social reality. According to him, the language we use isn't just a tool for communication. It shapes how we see and understand the world. He believes that the language we grow up with influences our thoughts and experiences so much that it's like a guide to the social reality around us. Each language with its unique grammar, vocabulary, and ways of organizing meaning, creates a distinct perspective on the world. Lotman, the Soviet semiotician, like Sapir and Wolf, believes that language is at the core of culture. He sees language as the primary system that shapes a culture, and everything else, like literature and art, as secondary systems derived from language. For Lotman, language isn't separate from culture. They're tightly connected. It's like the heart and the body. Without it, the body can't function properly. Similarly, culture can't exist without being deeply tied to language. In terms of translation, this means that just looking at the words in a text isn't enough. Translators need to understand the culture surrounding the language to capture the full meaning. Language and culture as intertwined. Lotman stresses the deep connection between language and culture. He claims that neither can exist without the other. Language relies on cultural context for meaning. Culture is fundamentally shaped by language structures. It's like a surgeon operating on a heart. They can't ignore the rest of the body, and translators can't ignore the cultural context of the text they are working with. In his article on linguistic aspects of translation, Roman Jacobson distinguishes three types of translation. Intralingual translation, rewording. Intralingual translation is essentially about expressing the same content using different linguistic forms while staying within the confines of the original language. Essentially, it's rephrasing or rewording a statement without changing the language. For instance, when you paraphrase a sentence or explain a concept using different words in the same language, you're engaging in intralingual translation. Such as, original sentence, 
the Climate Change Conference yielded significant agreements. In trilingual translation, the Summit on Climate Change resulted in important accords. In this case, the meaning remains within the same language, English, but the expression has been rephrased. The process involves finding synonymous words or alternative structures to convey the original idea. Interlingual translation It involves transferring verbal signs, words, phrases, sentences from the source language to the target language. For example, translating a book from English to Spanish or vice versa. Intersemiotic translation it is also called transmutation. This type involves the interpretation of verbal signs into nonverbal sign systems. It involves expressing content from one mode of communication, like language, into a different mode such as art, music, or dance, etc. Example Imagine a beautiful poem about nature. Instead of reading it, Someone creates a stunning painting that shows the same feelings and ideas as the poem. Or, turning a novel into a movie. The words become moving images, and actors show what the characters are saying and doing. Jacobson also points out that when moving from one language to another, or even just rewording something in the same language, there is rarely a perfect match in meaning. Even words that seem like synonyms, like perfect for ideal or vehicle for conveyance, aren't entirely equivalent. Each word carries its own unique set of ideas and feelings that can't be perfectly transferred from one language or context to another. So, while dictionaries might suggest words are similar, they often can't fully capture all the associations and nuances of the original word. Decoding and recording are integral processes in translation. Decoding. It's the process of understanding the meaning of a message in its source language. When a translator decodes a text, they comprehend the content, intent, nuances, and cultural context embedded in the original language. Decoding involves grasping the message and its various layers to accurately understand what is being communicated. Recording This is the subsequent step after decoding. Recording involves re-expressing or rephrasing the decoded message in the target language. It's the act of translating the understood meaning into a new linguistic form while considering the cultural and linguistic differences between the source and target languages. In essence, decoding is understanding the original message, while recording is expressing that understanding in a different language or form. Both processes are crucial in the translation process to ensure fidelity and accuracy in conveying the intended message from one language to another. Eugene Nida, a renowned linguist, devised a three-step approach to explain how translation works. Analysis First, translators dig deep into the source text. They dissect it to understand its meaning, cultural context, and language structure. Essentially, they decode the layers of information in the original text. Transfer. This step involves moving the meaning from the source language to the target language. It's not a simple word swap. It's about finding the right expressions and concepts to convey the message accurately. Restructure. Finally, the translated text gets put together in the target language. This stage involves refining the language to ensure it reads well and effectively communicates the intended message to the new audience. Translating seemingly simple words like yes and hello can reveal hidden complexities due to cultural nuances and language-specific usage. While French, German, and Italian are all Indo-European languages, their approaches to these basic greetings and affirmations differ significantly from English. For instance, in French, there are two words for yes, O-U-I, and C, each with nuanced meanings. O-U-I is the general affirmative, while C is used for confirmation, agreement, or sometimes even to contradict politely. So, an English translator needs to be cautious when choosing the appropriate term that aligns with the context. Problems of equivalence in translation refer to the difficulties encountered when trying to find an exact or fully equivalent match for words, phrases, idioms, or concepts from one language into another. These challenges arise because languages differ in structure, cultural nuances, idiomatic expressions, 
and context-specific meanings. Some words or phrases don't have direct equivalents in another language. Idioms are culturally specific expressions whose meanings might not translate directly. Words might have multiple meanings or subtle nuances in one language that don't exist in another. Translating idioms, like jokes or puns, is harder than translating regular words because they depend heavily on the culture. They have special meanings that aren't obvious from the individual words. The Italian idiom, menare il campo e le aie, which literally means to leave the dog around the threshing floor. If you translate it word for word into English, it makes no sense. In English, there is an idiom to beat about the bush that means the same thing as menare il campo e le aie, prevarication or avoiding the main point. So, instead of the awkward literal translation, we use the English idiom for meaning. In his definition of translation equivalence, Popovi distinguishes four types. Linguistic equivalence. This is the most basic level, aiming for word-for-word -word correspondence between the source and target text. It's like a literal translation, focusing on individual words and their equivalence. Paradigmatic equivalence. This moves beyond literal translation, considering the grammatical structure and patterns of both languages. It involves finding equivalent grammatical elements, even if words themselves might differ. Imagine replacing grammatical tenses or sentence structures while maintaining the overall meaning. Stylistic equivalence Here, the focus shifts to capturing the tone and atmosphere of the original text. Think of finding a different expression that conveys the same feeling, even if it's not a direct translation. Textual equivalence this level focuses on the overall structure and flow of the text. It considers things like sentence length, rhythm, and cohesion to ensure the translated text feels natural and reads smoothly in the target language. The primary aim of translation theory is to understand the intricate processes involved in translation rather than prescribing a set of norms for achieving a perfect translation. The passage argues that the debate on whether there can be a science of translation is outdated. Translation studies already constitutes a serious discipline that investigates the translation process, explores the concept of equivalence, and examines the meaning within this process. While there is no normative theory, the discipline serves as a valuable tool for understanding and studying translation. The notion that translation is a secondary activity with lower status associations is dispelled when recognizing the pragmatic element of translation. The relationship between the author, translator, and reader is portrayed as a communicative chain, acknowledging the translator's crucial role as both a receiver and emitter in the process. The passage rejects the old distinctions between scientific versus creative in translation studies. The debate about whether translation is a science or an art is outdated. It's both. Translation involves creative interpretation and adaptation while relying on linguistic and cultural knowledge. The complex system of decoding and encoding at semantic, syntactic, and pragmatic levels challenges the outdated hierarchical interpretation of creativity. There are more videos on my channel related to this chapter and this book. You can check. Thanks for watching and don't forget to like, comment and subscribe.